I'm a professor of infectious diseases uh, in adult infectious diseases and the chief of our division of infectious diseases here at UNMC. Kari Simonson, and I'm the division chief of pediatric infectious diseases in the Department of Pediatrics at UNMC and Children's Hospital and Medical Center in Omaha. Can you spell your name for us? K-A-R-I-S-I-M-O-N-S-E-N. -S -S -E Can you guys just start by talking about uh, whether you've seen any AFM cases here in the metro area and they're ones being investigated? Just kind of tell us what you've seen here in Nebraska. Sure. So, I don't know, Kari, you want to take that first? I've not personally been involved in the care of a patient with suspected AFM. But we're alert um, to the reports in ours and neighboring states for particularly children who might present with weakness of a limb as well as inflammation uh, in the spinal fluid. Those would be the things we would be looking for in our evaluation. So for your viewers, this uh, AFM stands for acute flaccid myelitis. And this is a disease that uh, we've really known about for several years. Uh, really came to the fore in 2014 with a cluster of children in Colorado and in California that presented sometimes after a respiratory disease with uh, acute uh, flaccid paralysis, usually involving one or more limbs. Um, interestingly, we've seen this sort of skip years. And so we had the initial year in 2014 uh, another bad year in 2016 where we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100 to 150 cases. And then uh, we skipped last year and then this year again seems to be a little bit higher peak. So we're on pace this year to equal about what we had in 2014 and 2016. Um, the uh, aspects of this disease that I think are worthy of pointing out is that we don't really know the cause of it. Um, it appears to be very much like a polio-like illness, but it's not polio. Uh, so it may be a virus somewhat related to polio, or it may be some other virus. Um, uh, some things that, that look similar to it are West Nile virus, uh, some of the other enteroviruses, for instance. So um, it's a mysterious disease. Luckily, it's very rare. So uh, less than one in a million uh, people are getting this in our country. And the, the thing that your viewers also would want to know about is the fact that this tends to peak um, in the late summer and early fall. So we tend to see it in August and September, and we should really be probably past the peak of it now, and it should be curtailing off. So uh, that is good news for folks who are worried about uh, seeing this. As Dr. Simonson related, this is primarily a children's disease, and we generally see it in kids uh, under the age of four. We know the Douglas County Health Department is investigating a case and that the child was released from a local metro hospital. Do you know if that child was treated here at Nebraska Medicine? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. How concerned should parents be? I know parents are hearing about this and kind of you know, getting worried about it. How concerned should they be? I mean, should we be pressing the panic button? I don't think parents should have undue concern right now. It's good to become informed about things that are going on um, nationally and potentially impacting our community like AFM. But cases are very rare, about one per million in the US. And so although it's important to know the signs as we've talked about, I don't think parents need to be particularly concerned Having said that, I think that there are some things that parents want to do to make sure that their kids maintain their health. So clearly being vaccinated against those things that you can be vaccinated against, such as polio. Uh, also with the flu season coming on, occasionally we have neurologic complications of influenza. And so we'd wanna make sure that kids are vaccinated against influenza as we start to go into that season. Um, avoiding mosquito bites, particularly you know, late in the summer, early fall, where, you know, with the snow that we just had, uh, obviously that's favorable to not having mosquitoes pester us anymore. But uh, in, in uh, past years and in future, uh, we want to make sure that we avoid mosquito bites and transmission of West Nile virus that can have a uh, paralytic uh, syndrome very much like what we're talking about. And then, uh, you know, just some simple things that your grandma used to tell you as far as making sure that your diet is okay, that you get enough rest, a little bit of exercise, you wash your hands, uh, those sorts of things will help to keep you as healthy as you can be. Do you think, I mean, obviously you mentioned get vaccinated. Do you think, I know you don't know the cause, but is AFM a repercussion possibly of not getting vaccinated? 
there, there's absolutely no data to suggest that any vaccine that we have is associated with this condition. And clearly, vaccination is your best way to prevent certain diseases. Again, we don't know the cause of AFM. Uh, appears to be maybe due to some other types of viruses, but there's some hypothesis that it could be related to underlying immunologic uh, makeup of, of patients and their response to certain stressors. So there's a lot of things we don't understand about this, but there's absolutely nothing to suggest that parents shouldn't be vaccinating their children. Based on the way uh, we've seen it transmit around the country and with rare cases popping up here and there, it does follow a pattern that would be consistent with potentially an infectious disease. And it does follow the seasonal pattern that we see with some of the other viruses like enteroviruses, which are spread by contact. So there's some suggestion, but again, since we don't have a particular virus or um, infectious agent that's been confirmed to cause all cases, we can't say with 100% uh, certainty. Can you speak to what's, what the care approach would be for a patient with AFM, what kind of treatment they would receive? Sure, so um, unfortunately there isn't any specific treatment for this uh, ailment. Uh, clearly supportive care, um, in uh, early initiation of physical therapy and rehabilitation and things like that may help. Uh, there are a number of modalities that have been tried in treatment uh, of these types of conditions, including steroids, interferon, uh, plasmapheresis, um, various kinds of immune modulators, things like that. There really isn't anything that has been documented to be very helpful. So uh, that is one of the aspects of this disease that is uh, somewhat discouraging, obviously. Uh, clearly, uh, work is being done through the public health system, uh, gathering data on these sporadic cases, trying very uh, diligently to figure out what is the cause of the illness, and then hopefully with that information, we may be able to figure out better treatment modalities. Uh, the other thing to understand about this is that uh, some of the cases that have been followed longitudinally do appear to have longer term sequelae, meaning that uh, some uh, of these children have remained paralyzed um, for the follow up period of sometimes years. Um, on the other hand, other kids recover completely. So it's a mysterious disease, very rare, and there's a lot that we yet don't understand about this. And because we've only been studying these cases for the past few years, we don't have long-term outcomes yet. And so as we monitor those patients over time, we'll get a better understanding of how many of them recover completely and in what time frame. Can you speak to some of the research that's possibly going on here at Rush Medicine or UNMC on, the, on AFM? Um, we don't have a specific research being done on this ailment. Again, it's extremely rare. Uh, there have been two cases in Nebraska that we're aware of. Uh, we are uh, participating and cooperating fully with the public health in trying to document cases to clearly try to document any of the triggers or the mechanisms that may be behind the disease. But there aren't specific research projects on this specific ailment, again, because it is so rare and we've not seen any of these cases. Could you, I mean, you mentioned 2014 and 2016, there were cases those years too. I, it feels like this time or this year it's getting a lot more attention? Do you feel like it's more severe this year or a reason for that? I'm not aware of, of data to suggest that it's any more severe. Um, as in those previous years, it tends to have a real uptick uh, in August and September and then starts to tail off in October and November. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll see that same pattern that now here we are in mid-October that these cases will tail off. Obviously, uh, when this occurs with a child, um, it is uh, very disconcerting. Um, it does capture people's attention, and therefore I do think that uh, these cases have been um, you know, brought to scrutiny, and perhaps that's what we're seeing now. Um, it is something that uh, folks do need to be aware of. Um, I, as Dr. Simonson related, uh, there isn't a cause for undue concern. Uh, but we do want to take some common sense precautions to try to, to prevent spread. And I think that as we've learned more over the past 
couple of years of investigation, you know, we talked about 2014 and 2016 also having cases that perhaps in 2018 now physicians and people in the community have a better understanding of what to watch for and perhaps the number of cases we've seen this year really reflects the fact that we've learned more, we're capturing more data around what these cases look like and have a better understanding of AFM. Do you know why it's those particular months that, that you're, you're seeing more? You said it starts to slump off in October. It does tend to have the same um, seasonal predilection as some of the other enteroviruses that we see. So enteroviruses are a broad category of viruses that can cause, uh, in some instances, respiratory disease. Um, in other cases, we see patients with some neurologic type of syndromes, and including aseptic meningitis, which is common at this time of, of the year, late in the summer, early in the fall. And it does follow that kind of pattern. Therefore, people have tried to implicate uh, certain enteroviruses or other similar viruses. But again, sometimes we are able to uh, recover these viruses or evidence of them, and in other cases we don't. And in the most recent cases, looking specifically for enteroviruses in the cerebrospinal fluid, in tissues, they've not been able to identify those viruses. Do you know in those previous years, 2016 and 2014, were there any cases here in Nebraska? Um, Carl, you may know. You know, I, I'm not aware of that data offhand. And can you talk about why um, Douglas County is saying, you know, they've submitted the, the testing to the CDC and it could take up to three weeks to get the results back. Do you know why that takes, you know, that, that amount of time? Is it a lot of, does it take a while to process that testing, I guess? My understanding is they're doing a whole battery of tests on those specimens, so they're looking at uh, various putative uh, viral etiologies for this. So it does take some time to do those molecular-based tests to really carefully uh, screen them for the presence of, of these types of uh, viruses. And I guess I'd back up to your previous question just a little bit. Uh, back in 2014, when this seemed to be implicated with a particular type of enterovirus, uh, of, a, of a respiratory nature, we did see some of those types of viruses within the community, but I'm not aware of particular flaccid paralysis cases associated with them. And from the public health investigation aspect to the work that's being done at CDC to try to identify an agent that's causing the symptoms is a bit distinct from the work that's being done by the care providers to help support that patient toward recovery and identifying that agent Today, we don't know that that would actually change the trajectory of care at the bedside. So the CDC is taking the time they need to try to search for as many potential agents as possible. Can you also just talk about, I mean, you mentioned some symptoms to look out for, but, you know, things parents should watch for are schools or daycares, um, as we know that this is, you know, not spreading, but that there are cases. I think the most dramatic um, finding is the sudden onset of weakness of one or more limbs. And that is not a subtle or uh, minor presentation. It's a, an arm or a leg that suddenly becomes very weak and can't be used normally. And so that would be something that would really alert a parent um, and a child old enough to communicate to that there really uh, is a problem and they need to be evaluated. Other associated symptoms uh, could include some fever or headache or stiff neck. And if you guys had a patient here, what would the treatment protocol be or what, what department would take care of them? Well, again, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, these are primarily diseases amongst children, so this would be uh, with our pediatric colleagues. And there really isn't any specific treatment for AFM. Uh, we would look for other things that might be uh, associated with that. So there are diseases like West Nile virus. Uh, there's another uh, relatively unusual neuromuscular disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome that is sometimes uh, preceded by uh, uh, diarrheal illness. So we would be looking for those other illnesses that sometimes mimic AFM, but there, unfortunately there isn't any specific treatment for AFM. It's really just supportive care, and as we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, trying to help these uh, patients and children to uh, recover as quickly and as fully as possible.
All right, thank you.